You know, the C64 Maxi and Mini and the VIC-20, which I was able to snag, are wonderful Commodore computer revivals. However, these devices focus on software emulation with either a keyboard, USB joystick, or USB drive is really the only hardware options available. What if you want an original Commodore computing experience that includes a Commodore-specific keyboard, cartridge support, IEC device support, and original game controllers and mice. You might think that the only option is to search eBay for a working, original, and used Commodore computer, and who knows what kind of quality that's going to arrive in. I recommend you wait for now. You may have the opportunity to purchase a new, in an original box, Mega 65. With an impending release announcement, I hope, I want to get everyone excited about the Mega 65. So, here's my top 10 cool things you will be able to do on the Mega 65 that distinguish this device from other Commodore recreations such as DC64 or a software emulator such as Vice, the versatile Commodore emulator. Before we look at the top 10, let's take a quick look at what makes the Mega 65 so special. The Mega 65 is a recreation of an unreleased Commodore prototype called the Commodore 65. Stands the reason that you would assume the Commodore 65 is the successor to the Commodore 64. The Commodore 128 was that device. But believe it or not, there was another thought. Maybe we do one more 8-bit release, and that's where the Commodore 65 came into play. The history of the Commodore 65 is an interesting read. I encourage you to review the Wikipedia page on this specific computer. As a matter of fact, all of the links I mentioned in this video will be found in the companion blog post that you can find down below. So make sure you check out the companion blog post for a lot more information than what I'm going to cover in this video. To put it succinctly, the Wikipedia entry lists the Commodore 65 as a prototype computer created at Commodore Business Machines between 1990 and 1991. It is an improved version of the Commodore 64 and it was meant to be backwards compatible with the older computer while still providing a number of advanced features that brought it actually really close to the capabilities of the Amiga. Also, according to the Mega 65 page, the Mega 65 is the 21st century realization of the C65 Heritage, a complete 8-bit computer running around 40 times faster than a Commodore 64 while being highly compatible. C65 design, mechanical keyboard, HD output, SD card support, Ethernet, extended memory, and other features increase the fun without spoiling the 8-bit feel. Hardware designs and software are open source. I have to tell you, having owned the dev kit for some time now, it does not spoil the 8-bit feel. Whenever you turn on a Mega 65, you really feel like you are on a Commodore computer. What's interesting about the Mega 65, though, is instead of a chip-by-chip -chip hardware recreation, the Mega uses an FPGA, or Field Programmable Gate Array, to emulate physical hardware. This FPGA allows the Mega 65 to receive regular core updates. I put core up here in these little quotations, as I will show you later. And these cores provide functionality not available on the original C65. There's much more to learn about the history of the Commodore 65 and its modern recreation, the Mega 65. However, that's really not for this video. This video and companion blog post highlights the top 10 cool things you will be able to do with the Mega 65 upon its release. Okay, let's get started and dive into the top 10 things you will be able to do on the Mega 65 with number one, use an enhanced Commodore layout keyboard. Throughout this video, I use the Mega 65 dev kit to demonstrate what will be possible on the Mega 65. This includes a wonderful mechanical keyboard. This is a similar keyboard to the one that the Mega 65 will include when it's released. Mechanical keyboards are all the rage and because of their popularity are more affordable. However, in the 1980s, this was not the case. Full mechanical keyboard switches came on expensive IBM and IBM clone computers. They were saved for what was considered business applications. Original Commodore keyboards were plunger based. They had this hollow kind of feel as you tap them. They weren't bad, especially when compared to chiclet keyboards popular on other 8-bit computers and were pretty relatively rugged. They, they, they stood the test of time and were easy to repair. 
I don't remember ever having an issue with my Commodore VIC-20 or Commodore 128 keyboards, and I was a pretty heavy user. Still, there's room for a modern improvement to this old classic keyboard design, and mechanical switches is the way to go. The Mega 65 includes a Cherry MX brand keyboard with a metal frame, so it's pretty substantial. The keys include the original Petsky characters, colors, and functions printed right on the top and front of the keys. Using the keys is a joy during basic programming and disk access sessions. You feel like you're using a retro computer with a modern keyboard, which is exactly what you're doing, so your typing is immediately more accurate. And these keys are not just single stamp, but double stamp for clarity and durability. This keyboard is built for the long haul and I'm looking forward to using it for many years on my dev kit. Here's a bonus, use this great keyboard with the C65 notepad software that's in development to take and share notes on the Mega 65. Could we see a word processor in our future on the Mega 65? Could be, I'd love to see one with markdown support so I can create these companion blog posts on my Mega 65 and then transfer them over to my Mac to deploy on my website or blog. All right, let's take a look at number two, play C65 games that could have been. It's hard to imagine an 8-bit computer could rival the graphics and gameplay of the original Commodore Amiga. However, the Mega 65 will emulate the original hardware designed by the development team for the Commodore 65. Listen to these specifications. It was to include a 65C E02. Now again, this is the specifications for a Commodore 65 that's being emulated in cores on the Mega 65 using the FPGA. So we're going to be mimicking that 65C E02, which is a MOS 6502 derivative running at 3.5 4 megahertz. It also will emulate a VIC-3 graphics chip named the CSG4567. Now this chip was capable of producing 256 colors from a palette of 4096. This VIC-3 chip is capable of producing the following resolutions and colors, so 320 by 200 by 256. Other modes include a 640 by 200 by 16 colors, 640 by 400 by 16 colors, 1280 by 200 with four colors, and get this, a 1280 by 400 in four colors. So those are some pretty high resolutions for an 8-bit computer, especially in the day. Also will support all of the VIC-2 video modes, text mode in either 40 or 80 by 25 characters, synchronization with an external video source, such as a Genlock device, those were really popular with Amigas, integrated DMA controller, two CSG 8580RS SID sound chips so that we get stereo sound, separate left, right volume filter and modulation controls, 128 kilobytes of RAM, expandable up to one megabyte of RAM, which doesn't sound like a lot, but would have been back in the day, and then a custom 120 kilobyte ROM. Along with a whole collection of Commodore C64 games, the Mega 65 will also allow you to play C65 titles. The Commodore C65 was a huge performance upgrade to even the C64, and even its more advanced, capable, and final 8-bit computer sibling, the C128. By the way, I have one of those ordered coming in to replace my original that I got rid of many years ago. I'm really happy about it. We'll be talking about that later. With these enhanced features, we should expect some next level 8-bit games and developers of the Mega 65 do not plan to disappoint. Let's take a look at some demos of what's on the way for the Mega 65.
Although Mega 65 titles are in early development, they are promising, and as developers continue to dive into the capabilities of the Mega 65, the games are sure to highlight what could have been in the early 1990s had the Commodore 65 gone beyond the prototype mode. Okay, number three, use Commodore 64 cartridges on our Mega 65, and could C65 cartridges be on the way? While we wait for Mega 65 game titles, we can use the collection of Commodore 64 game cartridges since the Mega 65 includes a Commodore 64 mode and a cartridge port. Unlike the C64 Mini or Maxi, the Mega 65 includes the required cartridge port. When you insert a C64 cartridge into the Mega 65, it will boot straight into Commodore 64 mode. With my early release dev kit, most games work. However, some utility cartridges such as the Epix Fast Load and the Future Was 8 Bits Kung Fu Flash aren't yet supported. The developers are aware that C64 emulation is incomplete. However, they remain committed to compatibility and also support the creation of a dedicated C64 core. More on cores later. At this point, I have to throw in a huge thanks to my neighbor, Slowfunk, at Slowfunk on Twitter, aka Jamie for me, for the opportunity to test some of his cartridges. You know, some people have neighbors where you go and you borrow their lawnmower. I have a neighbor where I go and borrow 8-bit joysticks and computers and software, and we uh, talk old school computers. That's a pretty cool neighbor to have. Good to have you as a neighbor, Jamie. So I asked the developers, do we think there will be C65 compatible cartridges? And what they told me is, Maybe there's no technical reason why the Mega 65 can't have Mega 65 specific cartridges that include additional memory. I do hope some industrious developer will ship a title on a cartridge in a box with instruction manuals and of course those wonderful supplemental materials like posters and stickers. That's the true retro experience I'd like to have again. The fourth cool thing you're gonna be able to do with the Mega 65 is you're going to be able to learn how to program in BASIC and also use a cool development environment called Eleven. The joy of owning a computer in the 1980s was learning to program in BASIC. You had to if you wanted your computer to do anything, especially if you didn't have a data set or floppy disk. You turn the computer on, you had to do something with basic programming in order to make your computer do anything. And for me, it was many months later before I could afford to purchase a Commodore data set for my Commodore VIC-20. By the way, rocking the VIC-20 shirt today. When I had the Commodore data set, I could then save code that I had spent hours of typing. And yes, there were times when I would spend time programming in basic only to turn the computer off because I had to go to school. But imagine how much fun it was to finally be able to save those programs. And finding software and cartridges and cassettes was impossible in the small town where I lived. There was a Radio Shack in town, but the only software they stocked was for their own TRS-80, which our school bought into. My software option was to get a subscription to compute and run magazines. Each month, their arrival would include basic programs ready to type, save, and run. While typing in programs, I learned about basic programming commands and logic. It was a great way to learn how to program in basic. Luckily, the Mega 65 includes a huge upgrade to Commodore's original BASIC version 1.0. Version 10 integrates commands from BASIC 3.5 found on the Commodore Plus 4 and version 7 found on the Commodore 128. By the way, if you're interested in BASIC 3.5, be sure to check out my Commodore Plus 4 Users Manual series where I cover about every command. It's a pretty cool chance to see what the capabilities of BASIC 3.5 were to include new commands such as graphics and sound. Also, if you'd like to learn how to get those programs from print into your computer without typing, I do have a video on that. Be sure and check out the companion blog post for that information. You know, basic programming is great. However, in development is a wonderful Mega 65 development environment called Eleven. With Eleven, you develop games and software using an enhanced basic structure, no lines, go-to statements. So it's more modern take on basic programming. Not only do you have this more modern structure, but you can compile the software right on your Mega 65. Add 11 to the power of the Mega 65 and you have a convenient on-device development environment. I can't wait to dive into 11 and give it a try. Number five, use a wired wireless USB mouse or joystick. 
Unfortunately, many input devices from the 1980s were not built to last and finding devices that work can be a futile or expensive proposition. Game controllers were abundant by many manufacturers in the 1980s and the Mega 65 uses the standard DB9 connectors found on other systems such as the Atari 2600. The Mega 65 includes two DB9 connectors, so you can use those early controllers or you can use recent recreations such as the Competition Pro or the Hyperkin Trooper or Ranger, which the Ranger actually includes a paddle controller. Be sure and check those out. Hyperkin also produces the Ranger adapter for multiple paddles. In the future, it may be possible to play four-person paddle controller games on the Mega 65 like we did on the Atari 2600. Commodore also produced the 1351 mouse. However, to my knowledge, no one makes a modern recreation of a Commodore 1351 mouse, and these are very hard to find, and if you do find them, you're gonna spend a lot of money for a little mouse. Many tiles made use of the mouse, one of which I'm going to discuss much later, and not having a mouse for the Mega 65 limits usability of older and newer titles such as the wonderful C65 specific solitaire game. Made with a mouse in mind, what are you to do if you don't have one? How are you gonna play solitaire? Well, luckily we live in a world where microcontrollers are a dime a dozen and tinkerers create amazing things such as something called the Mouster from Retrohacks.net. What's a Mouster? It's a device that allows you to use a modern USB joystick and mouse on an Atari or Commodore retro computer. It basically takes a USB device, converts that signal down, and runs that signal through a DB9 connector that plugs into your retro computer. Want to know more about it? Be sure and check out my full mouster post and video for complete information. You'll find all that information, of course, yes, again, in the companion blog post, link down below, all that business. Interesting, since I published this article, the Mouster folks saw that I was using it on a Mega 65. This was a project that they were closely tracking and have provided the Mega 65 team with a firmware file so that when you plug it in, it's ready to emulate a 1351 mouse, no configuration required. And you can get that directly and for free on the files host for Mega 65. I will tell you that I have a chance to use it with my wireless Vixing mouse, which I also reviewed and opened the box on, and it works perfectly with games such as Solitaire. It's so cool using a wireless mouse on a retro computer. Now you can use wired or wireless with the mouster, so keep that in mind. If you've got an old mouse running around, laying around, hopefully your mouse isn't running around, that's a different kind of mouse, you can use it on your retro computer once you get the mouster installed. There were many titles for the Commodore 64 and 128 that used a 1351 mouse. However, there was one title where this mouse was a requirement. We're gonna take a look at that in part two of the series. That's right. After this one, I'm going to break the video in part. We're gonna cover the six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 cool things in the next video. So those are the top five. However, I do have two bonus cool things that I was going to include at the end of uh, the, the top 10 cool things. Should I include one now? What do you think? Yeah, I'll give you a bonus. Let's do a bonus one. So this will be bonus number one of the top 10 cool things you can do with a Mega 65. Bonus item number one, connect to a BBS and the internet via ethernet. The Mega 65 includes an ethernet port. Now this is a feature not found on Commodore computers in the 1980s. This will be used for many things. However, the first thing that popped into my mind when I saw the ethernet port was, how do I connect the Mega 65 to the internet and access a bulletin board service or BBS via Telnet. By the way, I just recently talked about this on a previous video. If you have interest in the topic, I recommend you check out my Connect a Commodore Plus 4 to a BBS using a Wi-Fi modem post and video. In this video, I discuss how to access a BBS via Telnet and a Wi-Fi modem. It's not necessarily specific to a Commodore Plus 4 for about 50% of the video, so be sure and check that out. So I became aware of this feature during the Mega 65 May 2021 video update. At the time, I was researching for the Plus 4 video 
they demonstrated connection to the Boar's Head Tavern. I said, I have to give this a shot and include this in what I knew would be my next video, this top 10 series. I reached out to them and told them I'd like to feature this functionality, and they were kind enough to share their work in progress. Hausterberg Griff 3, while this software is limited to C64 mode and specific BBSs that are included in a pre-built list, it does demonstrate what will be possible and it should be easy to port this software to C65 mode and add additional features such as a BBS selection menu. The experience is very good and the telecommunication software supports the all important Commodore graphics protocol. I can't wait to see what other features they add to the software so that we can connect to other BBSs, but also take that BBS software and expand it beyond the current capabilities to see what more modern BBSs we can connect to, or maybe even other Commodore or non-Commodore specific BBSs. Okay, that's it for part one where I covered numbers one, two, three, four, and five, and a bonus of the top 10 cool things you're going to be able to do with a Mega 65. In the next episode in the series, I'll cover six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, and throw in another bonus to give you a cool dozen features. See, I gave you more than what you expected. So make sure you come back and check out part two. Also, while you're at it, make sure you go down there below, you like, you subscribe, you join the fun, you check out the companion blog post, you let everybody know about the series, you share it on Twitter using the hashtag RetroCombs. By the way, I have a new email address. It is RetroCombs at iCloud.com. Also, I have a new URL that gets you to all the retro goodness on my blog. That is RetroCombs.com. Go figure. I bet you could figure that one out. So I appreciate you watching and reading, and at this time, Rachel Cohen's out.